Honeybees, they're like a super important part of your everyday life. And you might be wondering, how is that possible? How are honeybees that important? Well, honeybees help produce about a third of all the food that we produce. And as a result, they're worth hundreds of billions of dollars annually. Now, although they're incredibly important and incredibly valuable in North America and Europe and all around the world, in North America and Europe, we've been experiencing some major declines in our honeybee hive populations over the last few decades, with some farmers reporting up to 90% of their hives dying in a single year. So this is quite unsustainable. Now, there are a lot of different factors contributing to these mass die-offs in honeybees, ranging from environmental stress, pesticides, but one of the most important factors is Varroa destructor, a parasitic mite that lives on the honeybee and is also the heavyweight champion for the coolest Latin name I've ever heard. But before we start talking about this really unique and cool parasite that's doing devastating damage to the honeybee industry, make sure you like this video, subscribe, and leave a comment of whatever parasites you want to hear about next in the comments so I can start working on my next video. So, before we can really discuss how this parasite is causing so much damage, we really need to understand bees a little bit. As many of you know, beehives are run by a queen who lays all the eggs for the hive and this queen typically lives between two and three years, after which the hive will produce a new queen with each queen laying somewhere between half a million and a million eggs during their lifetime. Typically about 90% of these eggs that are laid during her life will develop into worker bees, which are all female and are responsible for taking care of the babies, also called brood. They're collecting the honey, they're defending the hive, and they're pretty much doing everything else you can think of. The remaining 10% of eggs will be males, also called drones, who are larger and their sole purpose is to breed with a different queen than die. Like literally, mating lasts for about 5 seconds where some of their organs actually rupture from the pressure, and then they are paralyzed and die shortly after. And those are actually the lucky bees, as male bees that are still present in the hive when winter is coming will actually be kicked out of the hive by the female worker bees because they do not provide enough to the hive to maintain them throughout the winter. But back to the queen and the bee life cycle. After the queen lays an egg in a cell, three days later the egg will hatch, and then it will be tended to for about five days by worker bees. After these five days, the worker bees will then seal off the comb and the bee larvae will pupate and emerge 13 days later for a total of 21 days for their development life cycle. This female worker after emerging will then get straight to work taking care of her sisters and will continue to work on the hive for about a month until she inevitably dies. Now the male drones are pretty similar, they just take a little bit longer for their full life cycle as they are a little larger, so they take a full 24 days. Now after hearing all this, you're probably thinking, worm talk? I came here to learn about parasites, not to learn about bees. And to that I would have to say, You are so dumb! You are really dumb! For real! They're really cool. But more important than my opinion, is this information is actually key to understanding Varroa mites. This is important because Varroa mites actually have two main stages, the phoretic or the traveling stage, and the reproductive stage. And knowing the bee life cycle is important because the reproductive stage actually occurs in the capped brood cell of the honeybee. Let me break it down for you. Varroa mite during the dispersal stage will be hanging out attached to a worker honeybee. Now, this mite is female and has already mated and is looking to settle down, so when the honeybee is tending to some of the larvae bees during those first 1-9 to nine days after the egg has been laid by the queen, the mite will then jump ship and start hanging out in the bottom of the comb. Once this mite is hiding in her new home, she is now called a foundress mite. And here the mite's just gonna kind of hang out for a little bit and wait for the cell to be capped on either day 9 or 11 for a female or male bee brood respectively. This is a dangerous time for the mite as it needs to avoid detection or risk being tossed out of the hive by a worker bee as it maintains the larval bee. So cleverly, these mites are able to alter their surface chemicals to match the developmental stage of the host that they're living beside. This allows them to blend in with their victims and smell like the bees that they are actually going to be parasitizing. In a sense, they're trying to be bees. Good news. We can finally be bees. This isn't your world, but we can be bees. This is good news. You can be a bee. Once the cell is capped off, the mite is free to start its attack on the bee with a much smaller chance of being discovered. So the mite will then climb up onto the developing bee larvae and will start to feed on the bee, making a relatively large hole in its side where it and its future offspring will feed on the bee's fat body. It used to be believed that the mite would just drink the bee's blood, or hemolymph as it's called, but more recent studies show that the mite is really actually going after the bee's tissue, directly consuming its fat. 
Approximately 60 to 70 hours after the cell invasion, the foundress will lay her first set of eggs, which are all male. Then, we'll proceed to lay female eggs every 30 hours following this first egg laying. Once these eggs hatch, the first thing they do is, well, they mate with their siblings. Ooh. Brother, ooh. Now, this type of weird breeding system isn't that uncommon in nature or parasite systems, and the way the mite avoids inbreeding depression or the buildup of negative genetic traits through inbreeding is still not fully understood, but it seems to be working for the mite. So, by doing the math, this specific type of egg laying time frame that the mite has evolved could theoretically mean that a foundress could produce between 5 and 10 daughters per infected worker bee. But fortunate for the beehive and beekeepers everywhere, in field settings this is typically lower, being between 1.5 and 3 reproductive cycles. One of the most critical factors in regulating how many daughters are actually produced during this phase by the mite has to do with which bee the mite gets a hold of. As you can probably guess, the timing of this mite is pretty locked in, but as I mentioned before, drones or male bees, they take about two days longer than the workers to emerge from their cells, which in turn allows the mite to have more reproductive cycles, leading to approximately 70 to 120% increased mite offspring when the mite is attached to drone brood rather than worker brood. Due to such a large increase in fecundity by parasitizing these drones, these mites have actually evolved to take advantage of this, and as such, mites are eight times more likely to parasitize male brood rather than worker brood. And remember this fact when we're going forward, because we're going to talk about it a little bit later and how it can be an important mitigation strategy for these parasites. But now let's keep focusing on what does this mite actually do, like what are the effects of the mite and how much damage is it doing to the hive? Well, let's get some perspective. See, these mites are typically between 1 and 2 millimeters long, which is fairly small. However, considering that worker bees are between 12 and 15 millimeters long, these things are proportionally massive on a bee. For a human, that would be similar to having a tick the size of a frisbee on your body, and this tick wouldn't only drink blood, but it would also eat your fat directly. So understandably, this parasite is no laughing matter for the bee. In fact, some studies have found that the average lifespan of a bee that is infected with a single mite has its lifespan cut in half, and oftentimes when there's heavy infections, bees can have more than one mite. Beyond the direct damage the parasite is causing to the bee, the parasite also carries a lot of different viruses and is actually an effective way to transmit viruses to other bees. You're guaranteed to catch a virus. Just ask this guy such as the deformed wing virus and the acute bee paralysis virus, which both in their own right can cause massive die-offs. Now, these might establish a presence in pretty much every country that has honeybees. So with that said, how do these mites actually get from one hive to the next? Well, one of the most common ways this is done is when honeybees drift between hives, and they do this for a variety of reasons, with one of the most common being robbing, where a strong hive steals honey or pollen from a weak hive, and during this process, the strong hive can either bring mites with them, or if the weak hive has mites, they might be able to crawl onto a bee that is currently stealing from that hive, allowing these mites to get from one hive to the next. And this is pretty effective, as some studies have found between 50 and 80% of hives infected with these mites, so it's really good at getting around. After a hive has been exposed, the mite population can really take off, with estimates showing that their population can double every month, which means that in less than a year if conditions are right, 10 mites could theoretically bloom to over 20,000 mites. And considering that the average size of a healthy bee colony is around 60,000 bees during the growing season, this would mean that about a third of the bee colony is having their lifespan cut in half. This is clearly a massive burden on a hive, and untreated hives are typically dead within two years after being infected. This is quite concerning as the honeybee population has had substantial die-offs over the last few decades, with some years farmers are reporting colony deaths of around 30%, which is triple the rate that is considered sustainable by the industry. Now, although Varroa is one of the leading factors leading to these deaths, it's not the only one, as these deaths are multifactorial, meaning that multiple stressors are all kind of working together to make the perfect storm. However, it is often stated that Varroa mites are likely the largest stressor, with one study in Canada reporting that over 85% of hive deaths during their study period were associated with Varroa mites. Now, in addition to these mass die-offs that have been occurring in these honeybee hives, there's another issue that has started to pop up called colony collapse disorder, which is a disorder that's kind of categorized by all the worker bees just leaving the hive one day, leaving the queen behind, and this results in the hive just dying because there's no worker bees to maintain 
the eggs, the pupa, the larvae. Now, the extent and the validity of this disorder is still somewhat in debate. Some people believe it happened, some people believe it's just a bunch of other things going on all at once. However, regardless of where that falls, one thing does seem to be consistent, that the more stress that's apparent in a system, the more likely CCD is to occur, with varroa mites and the viruses that they happen to transmit being two of the main stressors that are linked to CCD. Now, in a lot of my previous videos, I often try to harp on how these complex host-parasite relationships evolve with one another or how they kind of make sense in their ecology. And after watching this video, some of you are probably beginning to wonder, how did this host relationship evolve? Like, these mites don't really seem sustainable for the bee population. And to that, I'd say you are right. And that's because although varroa mites exclusively parasitize honeybees, in the US and Europe, farmers almost exclusively rely on Apis mellifera, or the European honeybee, when the mite's native host is Apis serrana, or the Asian honeybee. When infecting the Asian honeybee, there might only incurs limited damage, and this is due to several host defense mechanisms that have been evolved, with the most notable being increased hygienic behavior. This specifically refers to Asian honeybees being more likely to uncap and remove dead or infected pupa from the hive, and an increased propensity to groom one another. Additionally, when mites feed on bees, it releases a lot of toxic compounds into the bees, and counterintuitively, it has also been found that the Asian bee is actually worse at handling these toxins. And while this is bad for the individual bee, this can help protect the overall hive's health in a process that's called social apoptosis, as it limits the successful varroa reproduction by disrupting the mite's reproductive cycle. So by being more resistant to the mite, the European honeybee actually gives the mite a higher chance to survive. All the information provided about varroa so far would probably lead you all to the same conclusion. How come we're just not using the Asian honeybee instead of the European honeybee? And the main reason for this is that the Asian honeybee maxes out at about 10,000 bees per hive, if it's a healthy hive, making it about the sixth of the size of the European honeybee, and as a result, they produce a lot less honey, making them a lot less economically viable, despite their inherent resistance to varroa. Due to these limitations, honeybee farmers are kind of forced to use arachnicides, which is a type of pesticide that specifically targets arachnids, such as spiders, ticks, and of course mites, which can reduce varroa loads by up to 90%. Unfortunately though, the mites have started to grow resistant to some of these common arachnicides, and there is some data showing that the use can also cause some sublethal effects to the bees over time. Due to this, the current best practices encouraged by beekeepers and the community at whole are IPM strategies or Integrated Pest Management Approach, in which several different approaches are layered to avoid over-reliance on one strategy. Now, one of the most common methods to help reduce varroa loads that doesn't use pesticides is to selectively cull drone brood, which is done by encouraging the queen to lay all the drone eggs on a single section of the hive. Once these drones are then capped, the beekeeper can then just remove these drones selectively from the hive, and because Varroa is eight times more likely to be on a drone than it is on a worker bee, this can be an effective strategy to reduce the parasite load in the hive. However, it is also very labor intensive and alone will not likely solve the issue. So this paired with pesticide use and a few other adjustments are suggested for best performance. Unfortunately, Varroa persists as a considerable problem to the beekeeping industry and things are still looking quite bleak as all the solutions we have come up with so far have their drawbacks, either being too expensive, time consuming, or having some kind of other trade-off. However, don't lose hope as there are currently scientists undergoing research to selectively breed genetic lines that are more resistant to Varroa without having some of these other trade-offs such as reduced honey output. By doing this, farmers may be able to wean off pesticide use and establish a more stable equilibrium with the parasite, or tolerance as we call it. Specifically, people are trying to breed lines that are more hygienic, similar to the Asian honeybee, and this will be done by queen selection and rearing, only treating when necessary with arachnicides, and then when it's necessary to also cull infected hives to not allow the infections to spread. Additionally, the use of genetic markers to identify specific resistant lines or genetics that correlate with resistance has begun to be pursued. However, it is believed that no one single gene is responsible for varroa resistance, or that different genes will work differently depending on the hive that they're in and the environmental conditions, meaning that this process could still take some time to produce reliable and consistent results. 
I hope you learned something useful in this video and found it as interesting as I do. I personally have a big soft spot for bees as I had a hive for a few years before I learned I was deathly allergic to them. But if you like this, please let me know in the comments and please subscribe. See you next time.